experiment on new algorithms you're going to end up with results that you don't know clearly what is better what is good always sit in line with the offline results and i had kind of a strong opinion like you where i had a feeling that it would it's it's kind of a trending stuff a new tech that has come out it's going to be trending for a couple of months and it'll die down sometimes it's wrong yes obviously wait what, what do you mean before chat gpt and only gpt i haven't used it for recipes but yeah uh, when i'm cooking cold then i'm obviously I'm using it for recipes he built this debugging tool uh, in just two days Imagine a chat where tech meets banter, similar to your weekly meetings or your lunchtime conversations, but with a little bit more wit. So grab a seat, hit play, and let's get started. Uh, let's start with Nishant. He seems to be the most uncomfortable one here. <laughs> he likes to cook. Uh, I've heard that he makes really nice shami kebab. Uh, we have Raghav. He has recently gotten into photography. He has a dedicated equipment. It's called a DSLR in the world of iPhone cameras. It it apparently works. Uh, we have Abhijit, uh, who loves to play with Legos, and we have Harshit, who is a tea connoisseur. So welcome on board. Uh, the one common thing among all of them, though, is that we are all machine learning engineers. So let's begin from there. Uh, Harshit, what does it mean to be a machine learning engineer in in your own words? Let's say. It, it is something that's come up, come up in the last decade, machine learning engineer. Before that, it was all about software engineering, but now like all, we all see ML ar around us. Mm -hmm. So it's ML engineering is basically machine learning plus your engineering. It's like super set of engineering plus machine learning. Good. Uh, have you always been a machine learning engineer, or have you transitioned through different things? So my career path would be uh, I did my bachelor's in computer science, then did masters in. Machine learning, specialization in data sciences, mm -hmm. uh, and then I got job into optimization systems, worked in supply chain systems, and now I'm kind of transitioning, not transitioned into machine learning engineer here at Clans. And w what about you guys? Say uh, Nishan, like, have you always been a machine learning engineer, or is this something new that has come up for you? Like, I've been uh, studying data sciences for a while now. I've been a student, I would say, like for last ten years, and I'm still learning machine learning. Field itself, like I would say, uh, it's uh, it's a very new field in itself. Like where, uh, like as uh, like few years back, there used to be, you know, uh, we folks working on different set of technology. So it transitioned into cloud in last ten years, and then like re much recently, like it is the, the the new thing is machine learning, where we are working on algorithms and machine learning algorithms, putting them into production systems. Yeah. So this is like exactly like. Uh, more or less like what machine learning field is so like in in my head there is still a very vague line between data science and machine learning so what where would you draw the line so when you say that this is machine learning work this is data science and when they say data science they mean like you know data analytics plus a lot of sql plus uh, it could also mean like building models and you know uh, running these models in sql systems and then uh, just getting the predictions out whereas machine learning engineering is uh, 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 is a overlapping field where it is more about models putting them into a system making a system out of them and then using it for some other use case it could be like say a machine learning system in a uh, search system of a e-commerce website or it could be like a recommendation system in a music app a streaming music streaming app would it would it then be fair to call data science as the early part of the journey and machine learning as the later part in the software life cycle let's say uh, like few years back people used to call it statistician it like changed to a much cooler name data scientist and now i think it is getting normalized to a much uh, normalized name uh, machine learning engineer got it uh, sp speaking of the software life cycle, one of the things that uh, we do a lot in software is experimentation. And Raghav is our uh, in-house experimentation expert. So what, what does it take? So, what, so when someone says that they want to experiment on new algorithms, uh, why does it need to be something that a dedicated person needs to look at? So experimentation is a hard problem. Generally, people don't think about it. People try different solutions at a problem, right? So they try solution A, solution B, solution C. But if you don't have a framework on deciding how you are going to go about like 
trying these solutions, you're going to end up with results that you don't know clearly what is better, what is good, what is the best solution for the problem. Now, experiment, uh, experimentation and experimentation framework comes into picture there to help you, guide you into going into a experiment in a fixed way. Like basically, you have a particular way of going about it, selecting metrics, deciding how you can measure an experiment, how you can tell solution A is working better than solution B. And using that, you can clearly get a winning solution. That means you can also, like experimentation framework is supposed to help you experiment very quickly. So when you say experiment, what, what kind of experiments do you mean? Anything. So anything can, in a uh, system can be experimented. So you can experiment on a button color. Maybe a button color is better for an app compared to another button color. It could be ML algorithms. It could be that you are testing a model, we call model in ML is basically an algorithm versus another algorithm. It might be working better uh, for a user. How do you how do you say so? Like one of the examples that you took, like a button color could be better. W what does that mean? Could be better? You can think of it in that's the uh, crux of the experimentation. How do you say something is better? You have to decide your experimentation beforehand. Say uh, for a company, it might be better when a lot of people click on it. If it's inviting enough, or is it visible enough? So you might have different parameters to test it, and you might have different aims going into an experiment. So if you have a goal where you want to improve click on a button, then your goal will be, well, your metric will be to measure that click through rate on that button and your winning is decided by when a solution basically improves that. All of this can be different, like your success could be completely a, a different metric. You can say that I care about visibility of that button. So you can see how many impression that gets, how many times people actually, like you can even take surveys and say, okay, how many times that is even visible to the users. So a bunch of different success metrics can be there, but it depends on what you're going in with, what your aim or goal is. Got it. So speaking of that, uh, the other point that Raghav mentioned was, you can also experiment on algorithms. So Abhijit, uh, recommendation systems, that, that's our bread and butter here at Glance. So uh, the algorithms that we are building here, how do they fit in to the experimentation framework that we have? Given that, uh, from my understanding, you can always build an algorithm, test it on the data, and then you'll know for sure that this is the accuracy, this is the precision recall, etc. So why do you need an experimentation framework for your algorithms? So like you mentioned, right, uh, recommendation is the bread and butter of what we do, and not just for us, for many companies that dabble with recommendations. And it's the classic problem of uh, who do you show what and when. Mm. And when we want to play with this sort of a problem statement, we ideally want to get it right. So it's, it's much better not to show something to someone rather than showing something wrong to someone. Mm. So from that point of view, uh, the way experimentation fits in is, I'll give you a very simple example that, uh, that we kind of work with right now, right? So um, we have a huge user base. We have to... Uh, recommend for all of them and we have to do a good job with all of them now let's say that we have a user base that are not very active with the usage in our product mm. and there is another user base that's very active mm. so the kind of models that we run on the user base that are not active would be very different from the ones that we run on the ones where they are very active because you have less and more data yeah because we have less and more data and even the kind of data even if it is more or less could be very different mm. Some users may not like to click at all. They just like to see stuff happening in, in Glance. And other people, they would want to click a lot. Mm. So uh, to basically uh, cater to all these different user behaviors, uh, user experiences, etc., uh, we, uh, again, to come back to your question about why, how experimentation fits in, right? So uh, we have data. We can build a model, train on it, uh, leave, it uh, leave aside some portion of data to test it. Mm. But again, what you test on is historical data. And it is possible that the online behavior could change for some reason. Let's say it's, it's a seasonality. Mm -hmm. Let's say I trained my model on everything till November. I found very good results. I put it on production. But in December, holiday season, and things go kaboom. Mm -hmm. And things change a lot. And we are not able to attribute to this. So this is the classic problem where we uh, see the online results does not always sit in line with the offline results. So the offline results give you a direction 
okay, this is something that could work, could not work, but to definitely get a stamp on it that says this works, this moves our metrics by X percentage, we need what Raghav talked about, that framework that basically says that, okay, you, uh, we have uh, a particular model A, a particular model B, it has given us some sort of uh, improvements in our offline data, mm -hmm. we put it online on certain user bases, and then we compare it against a baseline metric, which uh, we know for sure is uh, works. So that gives us an idea, which is better than what. Got it. So, uh, so we, we very briefly touched upon the kind of work that we are doing here, right? And we will go a little bit more uh, deeper into it. Uh, but uh, let, let, let's take a high level view of what is happening out there in the world, right? So somewhere around the time of COVID, uh, we had this other thing crop up called as chat GPT. We just took the world by storm and uh, almost everyone right now knows or has used chat GPT in one form or the other. So. A two-part question, right? So, one, how do you use ChatGPT yourself like as ML engineers in your life? And two, like what, where do you see this going? Like what is your opinion on the progress of computer science in the field of ChatGPT? So, I got onto the ChatGPT or rather any GPT train pretty late so I, I again I had kind of a strong opinion like you where I had a feeling that it would it's, it's kind of a trending stuff a new tech that has come out it's going to be trending for a couple of months and it'll die down mm -hmm. that's what I initially thought and I started seeing this particular tech being plugged into pretty much every major platform or a, a, every major interface and that's when I started uh, kind of being intrigued about it and when I say major major from my point of view because I'm an engineer like uh, give some examples like what, what yeah so uh, the main thing that kind of really got me using chat gpt is it's plugins into our uh, our editor code editor vs code mm. where now uh, we basically have copilot and uh, something called copilot and something called uh, chat also with uh, with that what it basically does is it generates code for you so i'm typing in code and there are certain pieces of code certain pieces of sections that is very mechanical to do. You don't have to put a lot of thinking, but you know that you have to type in a lot. But didn't the IDs already do that though, like with shortcuts? I, IDs did shortcuts, it did autofills, but it did not fill in logical pieces. So you let's say there is a function called, hey, talk to Shashank, mm -hmm. and I'm ty typing in H-E-Y, and it autofills to, to Shashank, right? Mm -hmm. But it does not uh, tell me that I have to basically call this function in a particular context, with particular inputs and expect a particular output and do something with that output. Now let's say that this process is very mundane for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I have ChatGPT do it for me. But uh, so the so one of the reasons that I don't uh, like using ChatGPT a lot is that it is still uh, it still has that overhead of me checking whether what it has given is right or not. So for the most part, uh, I use it for searches. Let's say like if I want to quickly search a meaning of something or I want to look up some documentation and the documentation is a very good example. Sometimes I've seen it just make up documentation on its own. Like the, the function doesn't exist and it's just hallucinating, right? So uh, when that happens, is it still useful if you also have to constantly check whether what it has given is correct or not? So this already happens, right? Like if you're writing something, you will already write, uh, try something and it might not work. You try a bunch of solution and none of them uh, worked. You already do that. You try some solutions and you're not uh, getting solution or like it's working or not. And you might try extra stuff from ChatGPT, some other solution. Like, uh, you can try this also. It's equivalent of your mind giving you something, some new idea. And you try it out. Works, works. If it doesn't, it doesn't work. For me, I've been like using GPT from very long. Even before ChatGPT came around, just the GPT-3 when it released, I've been asking it questions, asking documentation questions. Sometimes it's wrong, yes, obviously. Wait, what, what do you mean before ChatGPT and only GPT? So ChatGPT was, as you said, came around in 2020 around like uh, COVID. But before that, there was GPT-1, 2, 3. So this is OpenAI's uh, product that was there. But it was not big. It didn't have a like a friendly interface like how ChatGPT has. 
it had very uh, basic text box you write nothing else one text box output it did, it would give mm. nothing else very simple but it was still based on the same technologies uh, that chat gpt uses but not in a chat format so what what changed the only change that happened before in the one two versions and the current one that we all are familiar with is the chat format is it one two three were just the scale they went from very small models to very large models then when chat gpt came from gpt3 that is when basically your uh, it went into chat interface and basically learned how to chat with a human learned as an i didn't get you so they trained it not only on just simple text data they trained it on chat of like how you have like uh, your friends chatting right you have a specific way of going about it you don't like you don't specify like some huge paragraph to your friend your friends you start with some single sentences then you uh, like jot down like uh, more and more and filter it down same way you can chat with chat gpt and basically that went from being like okay i explain everything about this problem give me the solution to okay i want this now okay you gave me something i'll, I'll basically say okay i don't need this i need more uh, better version of this and i can actually make it go to a better solution right in the chat box so it's it's the back and forth that yes. made it more natural yeah so they trained it on chat data that basically made it more friendly to humans and more friendly to uh, people who don't use ai in their life normally and how do you use chat gpt right now i use chat gpt for lots of things like everything from documentation as you said documentation uh, a lot of things okay like documentation is one of the hardest problem in uh, coding like there is lot of documentation separated segregated you have to find specific page in some website to get a detail uh, that's why stack overflow was big all the time because people there is a documentation people don't know how to find it and someone knows about it and they respond same thing happens with uh, chat gpt you want a specific documentation about a specific technology that you use and you search for it google is already uh, not great for uh, that kind of search and then you don't get it but if you go to chat gpt and ask it might be hallucinating but it also gives a lot of times very somewhere it's mentioned somewhere in the remote documentation site that it will pop up and you try it it might might not work but you, you can try it it's very hard to do otherwise uh, like things like this is very hard to do other than that i also use it for generating code snippets for like very complex uh, codes like i don't want to write c++ code for example like uh, i don't want to spend time thinking about like how this new language new as an uh, new to me works and all those things generate it you can fix uh, rest of it same thing like uh, you can generate test cases uh, anything mundane you would be able to just ask chat gpt to do it uh, so you can actually implement it in everywhere not just in software or any coding related people use it for recipes people use it for uh, generating lots of different like clothing attire fashion all those things so i think it's very uh, useful nishant do you use it for recipes since you are a chef uh i haven't used it for recipes but yeah uh, when i'm cooking code then i'm obviously I using it for recipes <laughs> what for planning recipes? itineraries travel traveling itineraries uh plus i've used one of the great uses which i found was in our team uh, so in our team uh, i think a month back uh, before the holidays so before the, so during holidays what happens is i mean holiday as in year end so during year end it's like office people go to holidays or so we don't actively come to the office it's like a uh, week off here uh, so at times uh, we need to debug our systems there might be some bugs in the production so there's this guy in our team excellent engineer webup he built this debugging tool uh, in just two days all using chat gpt and your uh, other systems like that so that was really helpful and we can see a technology like uh, helping us around so yeah so it was kind of blown away in just two days he was able to build a great system plus one more thing i which i which kind of struck me here is um, so it it felt as if ki the search of racks is complete in a sense is he's got a companion right now hmm. so for for the most part that i'm hearing this is uh, a system that you can use as a companion like you said yes. uh, it makes mistakes which is fine but it's still getting as a lot of the work done <laughs> as does any companion i guess yeah <laughs>